The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and Vanguard Investments Australia Limited, ABN 72072881086, AFS 22763, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right time, the right way for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are gonna do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Vanguard partners with advisors to give you and your clients the best chance for investment success. We support advisors with differentiated thought leadership, unique practice management ideas, high quality products and deep investment expertise. Our commitment is to help you, your clients and your practice succeed long term, aligning our mission with yours. Learn more at vanguard.com.au forward slash advisor. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate but also work and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients as well. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Well, every time we see a volatility event, we are reminded of just how hot the discussion comes between active versus passive. And every time that there is the market's doing fine, we also have the conversation that comes up between the difference between active versus passive. Uh, I've had the conversation and I'm shuddered, shuddering to think of the number of times when that active versus passive conversation has come up. It's so, so, as I say, I still, I still think, uh, continue about the time that I had in my career when I attempted active management, and uh, and I find myself in a far more zen paradise now, uh, in a more passive view of life. But uh, how much of that psychology really does play into portfolio allocation for clients? How much of that is going to help a retail advisor through his sleep, through his sleep cycle, and through his career as well? Uh, which is interesting. How much of that is just made up, and how much of it is luck? I am joined uh, by two very highly qualified people to help us navigate this uh, this this journey uh, to answer your questions of active versus passive management by, first off, Senior Investment Specialist, Strategy and Research at Vanguard, Libby Newman. Libby, how are you now? Yeah, good. Thanks, James. Good to be here today. Thank you. And uh, again, joining us for, uh, uh, I don't know how many times we've done it now, but uh, <laughs> an old mate, CIO of Morningstar, Matt Wager. How are you now, Matt? Good. Thanks, James. Thanks for having me. Right, this- no Again. problem at all, mate. Part of the furniture now. Um, That's all right. I've uh, I, I I've literally just uh, I just have written a, a note to clients talking about you know not, not to not to be too specific or anything like that, but about just how time in the market does have a tendency to give you a few grey hairs, and there's a few if, if a few grey hairs sort of pr- crop up over the years as as you keep on going through it. Wondering if being active versus being passive, uh, you know, has hasn't uh, hasn't helped some of those uh, hairs on the side of my head, but. Look, we're going to start this podcast the same way that we always start this thing off. Libby, uh, what do you do and how do you make money? Uh, hi. Um, yeah, I'm an investment strategist at Vanguard. And to your point just now on time in the market, like that's that's the nub of it really, time in the market versus timing the market is what, we, what we're what we about in terms of um, 
uh, passive versus active. Um, at Vanguard, my job is to go out and speak to advisors about all the great research that happens in the broader Vanguard group and economic, investment-related, advisor-related, all, ma- all manners of things. Um, before I joined Vanguard three years ago, I actually was at Lonsec for 13 years. Sorry, Matt. Um, so I do, I do have some experience on coming at this debate from both sides of the fence. So interested well, to hear where we go on the discussion today. Perfect. Thank you. And Matt, really, I mean, you, you, you've done it before, just so that people have a set of scene of, uh, of what it is that you do to punch in punch in at 7.30 in the morning and clock out at 2.30 in the afternoon or whatever happens over there. I'm kidding, obviously, but uh, run, us, run, us through, run us through a day in the life at Morningstar. So uh, my role is is CIO uh, for Asia Pacific, and, and we generally run multi-asset portfolios. We use active and passive strategies within our our portfolios. Um, we're obviously Morningstar is a much bigger entity. We are you know, we're, we're the, just the investment manager I'm part of the business that I work for. We have the manager research team as well, so get lots of feedback and input from them on this debate as well. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's what I do on a daily basis: run multi-asset portfolios. Well, there you go. And I think that these are two very highly qualified people to be able to answer the question for us about what. Active versus management. Now, I've got a string of questions that have come in through the Ensemble platform here, and uh, I'm going to be able to get to them in a second. First off, let's just set uh, some sort of a scene, generally speaking, without giving too much of a date on it. Um, but, I mean, and, and this is sort of part of the conversation that we're having, is that even in the commentary, if I'm about to ask uh, the two of you guys, if I'm about to ask you, what are you seeing in the markets right now? There's two different ways that you could answer that question. You could say, this is what's happening this week, and this is why you need to allocate, under-allocate, be aware of this, be aware of that. If you give more of a, this is what we're seeing this year, then that is an entirely different conversation. We'll get to that in a second. So g- g- going more of the second way about it, Matt, what are you what are you seeing out there sort of just over the, the six-month, 12-month period now? Look, I think that, that generally uh, at the start of this year, lots of people were expecting kind of recession and um, you know, certainly growth, economic growth, that is a surprise to the upside and probably markets had surprised to the upside as well. You know, we've seen patches of volatility, um, you know, some 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 weeks more than others. Um, and, and we generally say that, you know, market, we were quite constructive on markets, but, but they were starting to get a little bit expensive. Um, we've seen a few uh, ups and downs there. Um, and and maybe that's created opportunities to invest in in uh, at certain times, but but we'd expect more of that to continue. You know, certainly there's a bit of uncertainty around inflation here in Australia and globally, for that matter. And and you know, consumer under pressure, uh, growth slowing a bit. That's going to create a few um, air pockets here and there. We'd expect that to continue. Yeah, Libby, uh, any anything that you'd like to add to that, just on a, on a general thirty thousand foot look at the at the market. Yeah, I think we generally agree that you know some pockets of the markets are, are looking expensive, but I think what's um, what those periods of volatility highlight is that it's extraordinarily difficult to make those time those timing decisions day to day, at to hour, um, and that you know over time we know that uh, markets tend to trend up for longer than they than they contract in bear markets, um, and so having that balance of assets in your portfolio. Um, means that you should be able to benefit from those from those markets over the long term. So I think that's that's something that's at the core of what we would do, we would do. It, 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 am I right? Am I right in saying that the, the, that there is there's a thousand different ways you can answer that question of what you're seeing out there right now? And amazingly, it is possible. And this is sort of where, where a lot of the arguments on Twitter happen, where I, I spend a lot of my time in the financial Twitter uh, sphere. That you've got two people that are arguing about basically the same point. Because and the main difference is that they've got two different time objectives. You've got people that literally are just a buy and hold sort of pay, uh, situation. You've got people that trade minute by minute, trading the tape, yelling at each other about which direction something is going in the market. Both of them probably quite right, but but they're two entirely different trading styles. Yeah. I don't know where I was going with that. That's pretty. Much, that's pretty. Much perspective. I think that's particularly true, and especially in in the inflation um, picture as well. You can see that there's some assets that really do quite well, depending on where that inflation is coming from. That really do quite well over the short term, but sometimes those assets, like commodities, can be a drag on the portfolio over the long term. Whereas equities is probably going to be something that wins out. So it's you know it's looking at those those time frames can be really important in having that discussion. And inflation, I think, in the last couple of years has shown that that you can have assets that work well in that one to three year time frame. Um, but over the long term, it can be quite a different set of assets that can help you um, outpace inflation. 
So I think it's been a good lesson for us again from the markets. Yeah. Yes. And continue to get educated every single day and every week uh, that that goes on. Uh, how much does psychology weigh into this? So I'm just going to start with some of the questions that have come through the Ensemble platform here. With regards to clients and having the conversation with them, and I know that I've been having I've been having conversations with clients now for about two decades uh, if, of a career in this. Sometimes in the institutional, sometimes in the in the retail level. I know that definitely psychology does does weigh into it. Can, can you can you break down for me how to how to tailor and what sort of what sort of asset classes or what sort of I mean specifically what sort of active versus passive area or product that you'd like to be talking about with regards to which sort of client psychology that you could look at? Well, I think we looked at client psychology. Um, you know, that's probably one of the key roles of an advisor, really. Um, we've done some research around advisors alpha, um, and that yeah. shows that probably, um, you know, there's about 3% on that could be added over, over a period of time. And the bulk of that actually comes from those coaching conversations that a lot of advisors have in terms of not being too euphoric when the markets are running really hot, um, but not, you know, by the same token, if we have a down market um, sort of coaching people that, you know, don't panic, keep calm, carry on is probably your best your best course of action, really, because over the long term, we know that cash is unlikely to, to, to deliver the returns that you need to sustain retirement, um, ultimately, if that's what people are looking at. So I think that's... Um, and then I think you, you, the active active versus passive, I mean, it, that comes into portfolio construction discussions. And, you know, we talk to clients every day about, you know, using uh, passive as a as a core and then um, delving into other asset classes as a satellite. I know on previous podcasts you've, you've chatted about the asset classes where that might work as well. It tends to be that the, I guess, the, the – um, more highly covered or professionalised markets like international equities, it, it's becoming harder and harder for active managers to sort of to beat the benchmark and to overcome the fees that they need to charge because everyone I know who works in this industry doesn't do it for free and it's a lot more labour intensive process to to be managing active funds. So I think you know those are the, those are the, the conversations that we have in terms of thinking about um, coaching clients. We have a range of material that sort of helps clients to have those. Look, you know, zoom in and look at those those periods of time, just to show that it's not a it's not a straight line in the markets. There's going to be ups and downs, um, and just to coach clients through those moments, I think is where the where advisors can add the most value. Yeah, Matt, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, look, yeah. I mean, I think we've seen a few moments of volatility this year, um, and certainly over the ages, and and the message is very much, as Libby said there. Don't the message out to client was is don't panic. Um, I'm sure that's the message that advisors are giving them as well. Uh, and so, you know, that that's the key. Remaining invested is you know a, a much better way to think about it. You know, and and, and leaving you know I guess more active management decisions um, to the active managers. I guess as well in in a multi asset portfolio, asset allocation can be an active decision even if you don't think it is. Um, and so. Um, or even if you don't realise that that is, and so you know, leaving that, you know, not chopping and changing around portfolios unduly. We we tend to focus on valuation to to drive where we want to go in portfolios rather than just kind of this thing's gone up, that thing's gone down. Um, but markets do create opportunities, and and if you're panicking, um, you're probably the one that's uh, creating the opportunities for the active managers out there. To be honest. It does. It does seem like every single time we see some sort of a tremor or some sort of a, 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 an issue, it's another chance for the transfer of wealth to go from retail to institutional. And I, it's right. I for one, am sick of it, and I'm, I'm I'm making a stand in the whole thing. But I've got I've got here um, I quoted some some Morningstar research, and not specifically quoted. I'm not going to try and step on your lines here, Matt, about the differences in returns between active and index invested funds. The long-term horizon results. Did you did you want to get a chance just to go into that? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that you know, I've got I've got some high-level points, but but I think exactly what Libby said before. Certainly, in in a really efficient market like uh, international equities, you know, very diversified, a bit more concentrated over the last couple of years. But but with some of those large tech uh, stock names, you know, it, it's much harder to generate alpha um, for an active manager. And I think you know, pretty much. Uh, yeah, I think we've seen underperformance across the three, five, and ten-year time horizon um, for for international equities managers, and it's probably a similar story uh, in the bond market. Um, you know, again, the global bond market again, very efficient market there. 
Um, air, markets like Australia with it are a little bit inefficient. We've seen um, uh, some some better returns for active management. You know, there, there's obviously um, pre concentrated different pillars of concentration in the Australian market, and so perhaps it's just uh, I don't want to own banks, I want to own banks, or the same for small caps. Um, that that helps the uh, the Australian market, the active managers in the Australian market generate some alpha. But, but we have seen uh, in Australian large cap, uh, you've seen outperformance over three years and t- and over the longer term over ten years. It's been a more difficult period um, over five years if you look at that um, for active managers. But but I guess what what we're saying is here is that that um, there's always going to be opportunities for the for the best managers to to generate alpha, the managers that really have skill. And if you can identify that, that that's really important. Um, but they're few and far between, especially when you, you factor in things like fees um, and and the fees that that active managers charge retail investors in particular. Do you want to talk about uh, briefly if we could talk about and and again these questions are are open uh, to, to to either Libby or Matt on these ones. The the fee differences between active and index funds, and also uh, Matt, you mentioned you know performance is coming into it as well. How how do you find that performance out? How could, how could, how can a, an advisor actually have a better a be better equipped to have that conversation with clients with regards to performance? I mean, I think you need to look at the 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 uh, so the way that we would do it um, as investors is we certainly look at the alpha that can be generated net of fees. Obviously, that that, <laughs> that you have to do that. Um, and I can let Libby talk to talk to the fees more more generally, but but certainly, um, you know, active managers, uh, as Libby pointed out earlier, um, you know, they they need to pay a team. They you know they they generally can't you know have the scale of of say a Vanguard or a passive manager, um, because you know that would potentially erode some or decay some of the alpha that they can generate. You know, you talk about things like capacity for a strategy. Um, so you can't just grow indefinitely without becoming the market, I guess. Um, and so, um, you know, you want to be able to make sure that that you can generate alpha um, in the strategy that you have, and and certainly above fees. But I'm um, sure Libby has more to add there. Libby, over to you for fees. Yeah, yeah. I think um, you know, generally speaking, I think we've seen a, a decline in in the fees um, where we've seen indexing introduced to that market. Um, and I think, you know, on average in Australia, the industry average management fee is around 58 bips and at Vanguard, the average management fee is around 29. Um, and across different asset classes, you have quite a range of, of differences. So Aussie equities are on average in the in the 50s, um, whereas a lot of the, the passive ETFs, including uh, the Vanguard ETF, are sort of in the single digits now. Similar sort of picture in fixed income. I think we've seen some decline in, in what I observed as a, a the bond fund managers um, charging that has come down a little bit, but still sort of three times what you would pay in a passive fund. AREITs is probably another one where where the fees, um, where it's it's such a concentrated market as it, as it is, um, it probably that's where it's the case for an index allocation is quite strong because um, the fees are sort of two or three times, again, the, the 23 bips that you get in the Vanguard Aussie Property Securities Fund. Um, and similarly, on, on the international side, we see sort of 69, sort of around the 70 bit mark for international equities relative to um, an index fund around 18 bips for the, the MISCI International Shares ETF that we have. So you can see there's quite a, a disconnect between um, active and passive still um, in the market, and I think in the years that that I've been in the market, I've observed that you know that has meant that some managers have stopped um, offering certain types of funds that are closer to index, and started offering funds that I guess are a little bit more punchy. And so that's where we see that's an observation that I've seen in the last little while that means particularly in Australia where you've got mid and small caps is probably a little less efficient market. People might be pairing a, a passive exposure in Vanguard Australian Shares Fund, for instance, with with um, an active small cap manager, for instance, and we see that a, a lot in the portfolios that we look at in our construction discussions. Well, I'm, I've got a follow up for you there, Libby, but I'm reminded of a, a wonderful anecdote that I saw of a quote that someone said: "The best investment book ever written is called Shut Up and Wait." Yeah, and every page, <laughs> yeah. every page. Every page is just uh, the long term returns on the S and P five hundred. It's just the most incredible thing I've seen. Just yep. so you know. Um, so, what type yeah. of investments would would index investing work work best with? 
Uh, well, I'd say every every inv- every asset class has <laughs> an index fund that that works in that asset class. Um, it obviously works really well in listed asset classes. Um, so. Aussie equities, Aussie small caps, international equities. Aussie equities and international equities is where we see a lot of use. Um, and REITs, as I said, A REITs particularly. Um, bonds as well. We do see that that uh, passive investing is used there. Sometimes it's used in an active way, if that makes sense. So um, sometimes we see people pairing a traditional Aussie bond exposure that's tracking the 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 Ausbond Composite Index, the regular sort of Ausbond Index that a lot of active managers track, and they might be pairing that with something that has a little bit more credit exposure to it. And that's that's one way that you can sort of deliver a little bit more return to the portfolio. And if we look at um, some research that we've done on how active managers run their portfolios on the fixed income side, a lot of the excess return in terms of alpha comes when credit is really doing well. So you know, it's a little bit of a hack on on how you can run your portfolio. You can actually use passive vehicles to make active tilts and and sort of replicate what some active managers might be doing for um, in a more cost effective way. So, we see different uses different uses in, in different parts of the portfolio for for passive versus active. So, when it starts to get more tumultuous in the credit space, you would be potentially under allocated in a passive investment in fixed interest. Uh, yeah. yeah well, I was leading lead. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's there's two risks that you're compensated for in bonds. There's when you get your money back, which is essentially duration, and there's if you get your money back, which is credit. So if you're leaning too heavily into credit, um, your portfolio is going to be looking a little bit more equity-like and a little bit more exposed to risk. So it credit tends to be something that does less well um, when there's a risk-off event. And that's when duration does well. So I, I, I think having balance in the portfolio, not leaning too heavily into that credit space um, at the expense of duration, which is in your traditional fixed income, um, is is probably the best way to go. And we, in our diversified funds, we definitely have a very high exposure to duration because we want to know that we've got some uh, ballast in the portfolio for when you do have those bouts of volatility. And I think um, we've seen this in the last couple of months. We've seen, you know, equities have um, some conniptions and bonds have their flight to quality moment. And that's exactly what you want in a portfolio. You want something that's going to work when the things, other things in your portfolio are not working. So there's always a place, I think, for duration. Um, and if you do go down the credit, sp- uh, credit space, especially at uh, at the moment, I think we're starting to see some risks and uh, wobbles emerging in credit. Um, not mm. having too much is probably a, a good idea. I think uh, if, 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 I, if I can just talk to that a little bit, I think that, that you know, effectively what Libby says, I'd agree with. I think that really, as I said before, we think about, you know, we think about valuation in particular. And, and I think if you think back to, you know, the end of 2021, early 2022, then bonds in aggregate, um, you know, indexes had done very well for 30 years and bonds in aggregate were very, very expensive. And at those points in the market, you're not necessarily trying to time the market, you're just saying, using valuation, saying, well, how much more expensive can these things get? And so that was a time where where your bonds duration wasn't um, giving you any diversification benefit in a, in a portfolio. And so we would, you know, at those points, uh, we, we would tend to favor active management from a from the bond portfolio, whether we're doing that ourselves or hiring an active manager. And similarly, yeah. like uh, I think more recently, you know, as some of those tech names um, have really, you know, been on a tear for, for 18 months, um, maybe if you think about it, I know the Olympics were on recently, if you think about it in terms of the high jump, you know, some of those tech names are amazing um, and driving index exposure is higher, you know, the NVIDIA's, the Apple's, the Magnificent 7. Um, but the bar eventually, they, no matter how good the high jumper is, they eventually they're going to knock off the bar. Um, and, you know, because of the size of some of those those names, they're going to take the index down. To, you know, maybe, maybe not too far, they're going to take the index down a little bit with them. And so, um, you know, they're, they're just points to be aware of when you when you are invested in um, in just pure index um, exposures. You, you just want to be aware of the valuation that's embedded in that and, and some of the risks around that. No, very good. Now, okay, I've got a follow on there for you. And also, I mean, Matt, how dare you? How how very dare you accuse the Magnificent Seven of possibly being too much of a weight on the index and, and having any downside risk? 
I don't even know how to respond to that. I don't. Obviously, I'm being <laughs> these are some Um But yeah, it, it's it, they are, and they will continue to be a risk. That being said, they do continue to to, to get over that hurdle or high jump, whatever whatever metaphor you wanted to use on that one. It's it's just phenomenal. I mean, earnings earnings results just just passed you know a, a while ago. Um, showing, I think that they had a nine percent year on year growth expectation for the entire index. They managed to jump over it to eleven percent, um, and people thought that was tough because nine percent was a a big year on year target for the American market in the equity space, and they still managed to jump over it. So we we, we are seeing growth. We continue to see growth. Inflation is now a big question mark. That's over. What I think, what I think is good. And I'll get. I'll, I, I am coming to some sort of a point in just a second. What I think that we've, and you're right here, Matt, that we have seen this time where there hasn't really been any diversification in the equity bond space. Bonds, you know, with with, with a, an easing in yields, you've seen equity sort of keep on going and everything's sort of okay, that you haven't really, everything's traveled in the same direction. I think that maybe over the next couple of years, you're, you're going to be able to have the benefits of a nice sitting there passively 60-40 portfolio um, that will actually be able to protect you on, protect you when there's a downside because there will actually be a flight to bonds when the equity market has a bit of a hiccup. And vice versa yep. on the other way. Am I am I too far off the mark there from Vanguard on Morningstar and making that statement? No, I would agree. I mean, I th- I think what I was saying is probably the opposite of that. Back in twenty twenty one, that you know there was the core concept of the sixty forty portfolio being dead, and it, it died a death in twenty twenty two, and then was you know came back to life again. And, and so I'd agree that I brought it. Certainly, you can build it. That's right. You can certainly build a a, a really reasonably diversified portfolio now um, relative to where you were. Um, a couple of years ago, and I think that that that's a, yeah, that's definitely a a positive for investors. Yep. Okay. Let's yeah, go on, at, go on, Libby. At, well, yeah, we would argue the same that it's you know you, now you you're earning a lot more in your bond side of your portfolio. Um, arguably, maybe the equity risk premium on top of what we think you know we think that we're returning to a, a more um, normal environment in terms of rates, rather than being close to zero for for. A number of years, we think we're sort of back into normal territory, um, and so we don't think that the equity risk premium that you might be earning on top of that is going to be as wide as it was when you were essentially being pushed into pushed into risk assets. Um, we would argue that that on the on the sixty forty, you know, there's been a sixty forty portfolio. I think there's one that's sort of ninety years old in the US. Um, so they certainly stand the test of time. It did have a bad year. Um, but I think you know one bad year does not a uh, um, does not dilute the the whole premise of of a sixty portfolio forty portfolio. Yeah. I think cash cash was the top performing asset class in twenty twenty two for the first time in thirty years. So if you're in cash, then clearly you did well. But for the other twenty nine years, you probably did not do so well. So yes, I think it's yeah time. I mean, time in the market is yeah. clearly very important. So, well, the, 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 there was that time, and that, and that it does, and everyone says I told you so. And as much as I was in twenty twenty one with with my note talking to clients on the on my own podcast and various areas that I was doing, saying through twenty twenty one, beware the, the the bond market is going to have a bit of a, a bit of a meltdown, and probably equities might be taken along with it, but definitely definitely there won't be that many. Play- Even that that being said, because we knew we knew that yields were going to rise, we knew that yields were going to rise post COVID with the inflation to battle that. To, to Some people have knew that for be... fifteen years, though. Like, <laughs> I think post post GFC, I think I heard that for about a decade. So eventually, yeah. you got to be right, of course. But yeah, I think well, yeah, if you if you look at real yields, that 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 showed how expensive the bond market really was relative to you know the previous twenty nine years. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes sometimes you get sometimes you get these opportunities where you are just like you know what we're we're going to step out of this passive space and just go. Just temporarily active because right now we can't deal with having having this sort of pullback in 2022. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got a couple of questions. In what situation would you go? You know what? We just need to to, to, to drop down how much we've got. Just lying lazy in the market, not lazy. You know what I mean? Lazily, passively in the market, um, and maybe just step up some of our active, uh, i.e., be sort of passively active or actively passive, if you know what I mean. Uh, let's, yeah. let's let's start with equities. When when would be the time that it would be considered? Like what? what what sort of flags would you look out for in that space? Well, I think a lot of people have been talking about, um, you know, on the equity side, you've, you've already mentioned the Magnificent Seven um, being a, a higher weight in the index. If you look at a, diverse, a regular diversified portfolio in Australia, maybe a balanced portfolio, actually there tends to be a high weighting to the, the top 10 in the Aussie index and not the Mag, Mag 7. So, and I think 
you know, the thing with the power of indexing really is that over time, the proverbial 10-bagger or 100-bagger that everyone's seeking in an in- in an index fund, you've got a 100% chance of having that in your portfolio relative to an active manager where essentially you're, you're taking the chance that they might have that in their portfolio. So I think, you know, the, it, over time, the skewness of the market, which is essentially the average return that you're getting, which is driven by those 10-bagger, 100-bagger, 1,000-bagger in the case of NVIDIA, maybe, um, you know, that ultimately drives drives your market return over time. So I think, you know, being patient and just waiting for that um, to effectively you're harnessing the, the the intellectual property of the entire active active management community as well, being in, in a passive fund. So you know, that's that's and, and in a low-cost way. So I think there's always a place for, for passive in the portfolio. Um I know that we're having discussions with clients who might be wanting to lean away from that. I know a lot of active managers have leaned away from the MAG7 and left some money on the table so far this year. So it's just, again, it comes down to that that timing decision and consideration of of, of when you might want to sort of hold them or fold them um, relative to to how much how much you think you should be making. On the on the fixed income side, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that 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 it's passive. Having run a passive fixed income fund, the index fund is cha- the index is changing all the time. There's cash flows that are always coming into the fund in a fixed income fund. So you've always got coupons that are happening. You've always got maturities that are happening. And this is quite different to an equity equities equities fund because essentially equities are, are issued and that sort of stay out. Um, um, bonds have a finite life. They mature after their three, five, ten years, however long their life is, and that cash needs to be reinvested. So we've been reinvesting in in higher coupon bonds in the index um, for a long time, like as long as uh, the last couple of years, we've been reinvesting cash flows daily, weekly, monthly in those New York higher coupons that are coming through. So we're actually being quite active in, in investing those in those new higher coupon bonds relative to an active manager who – quickly could just um, have a static portfolio in the index move ar- moves around them and active and they might end up being active by actually doing nothing so I think there's is you know particularly on the fixed income side there's a bit of misnomer that passive means just just sit there doing nothing but not okay no I, that, that, that makes sense? I did follow it. no it, it does make sense and I was about to ask you if there was any and, and you did mention different types of clients or different spaces and everything like that so uh, we may have sort of half so we actually we have sort of half touched on it but is is there any Vanguard research that you've got on the different types of clients that that require the different types of 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 thing with regards to different uh, different asset classes? I mean, we see commonly in in the interactions that we have with advisors, a lot of advisors use passive for their lower balance clients because it's a simple and effective way of gaining of gaining exposure to the market without sort of giving mm-hmm. away too much of the of their returns, um, and. But by the same token, we see a lot of a lot of high balance clients using the using the same methodology. Um, it probably comes down to objectives as well. We do see that some clients uh, might be looking to tap into other risk premia that may not be available in an index, or they may have capacity to take on more liquidity risk. And so that's where we see that you know sometimes there's a use of I I guess other types of risk premia in the portfolio. Excellent. No, no problem at all. Look, I, I've, I've actually run out of advisor questions through here from the platform. We've talked about psychology. We've talked about um, about the different methods that you can use, active and passive. We've talked about satellite core, which is which is cool. We've definitely talked about volatility a, a fair amount. Uh, we've 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 talked about when index funds are beneficial and they're strong versus when, when they're not. I think that we're done. If anyone's got anything to add, please speak now. Or otherwise, I'm going to have to close this podcast. No, I mean, I'll just I'll just say that there's most certainly, as Libby said to start with, a place for both active and passive in in a portfolio. And and you know, you just want to be very careful selecting the active managers that 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 you can that they can actually deliver over the long term. Um, and and certainly, um, ha- using passive exposures. Um, you want to be aware of the risks there as well. You know, there's certainly a momentum uh, factor that drives indexes um, and becomes a bit self-fulfilling at times. And so as long as you're aware of the risks, um, which don't get included in some of those Morningstar surveys, I have to say, uh, um, either way, um, 
but but uh, you know it's only based on returns. Um, if you, as long as you're aware of the risks both in the active space and the passive state space when when you're putting together a portfolio or selecting a multi asset manager to look after your SMA or whatever it might be, as long as you're aware of those risks, then 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 that's the uh, that, that's certainly a key thing to be thinking about. Well said, very well said, Libby. Last words. Um, yeah, I think ultimately cost matters. Like you can get a high value from your investments from a, a low cost solution. Essentially, you want to be you want to be keeping more of your return over the long term rather than having it eroded by fees. Um, and really, that can help. And it helps to simplify your practice as well. Um, you know, rather than obviously you can you can call on the expertise of Matt and and his team to help you manage those active management exposures. But if you have a core allocation to an index, you'll guarantee that you know what you're getting from that part of the portfolio. And then you can use that, you can um, supplement that with some active management around the edges. And it just means that rather than maybe monitoring six or eight different managers in your equity sleeve or 10 different managers, you might only have to monitor two or three. So that just frees up your time in your practice um, to be doing what your clients actually value the most, which is having those 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 conversations about what's going on in their life. Excellent. Well, th- thank you very much for that. Uh, Senior Investment Specialist uh, for Strategy and Research at Vanguard, Libby Newman, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And Chief Investment Officer at Morningstar, Matt Wager. Thank you, Jimmy. No worries at all. You have uh, been joining us for the Ensemble Investment Podcast with, with regards to active versus passive, I hope you've learned a lot. If you have any questions, please plug it into the platform and uh, and our team or the team at, at Ensemble or myself will uh, be more than happy to help you out with that one. Uh, it has been brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team. Uh, I'm going to get back to work. Thank you for joining us all. Mm-hmm.